Good. Okay. All right. Hey, hey, everybody out there. My name is Dr. David Bozak. I am a physiatrist who specializes in pain management uh, with Pennsylvania Pain and Spine Institute. I've been here for almost five years, and I just wanted to talk today a little bit about spinal stenosis, which is one of the most common things we treat um, that affects both the back and legs. Um, it is thought to be found in over 2 million people in the United States who are symptomatic from this condition, so it's incredibly common. It's much more common uh, after 50 years old. So once you get into that fifth decade and beyond, that's where it becomes much more likely that this could be causing your symptoms. So what are the symptoms of spinal stenosis? Uh, the most common stuff is from the low back and or the legs. So you can have numbness or tingling in your legs or your feet. You can have uh, some weakness type feelings in the legs and you can have pain or even cramping sensations either in the low back or the legs or both. And one of the hallmarks of spinal stenosis is that it tends to get worse with any prolonged standing or walking and it tends to get better if you lie down or lean forward over a shopping cart or a walker or something like that. So if those symptoms sound at all familiar to you, then it's possible you have some spinal stenosis. Um, the causes of it, um, there's multiple things that can cause it. One of the most common, though, is a thickening of a ligament in the back of your spine that over time, as we get older, this ligament thickens and it can then encroach into the spinal canal. You can also, it can just be your run of the mill, you know, arthritis, so to speak, in the spine, which can have some bony overgrowth or some bone spurs associated with it. And those can then encroach into the spinal canal. Um, because essentially what it is, if, if you picture the spinal canal like a tube, um, I have a just empty toilet paper roll here. And as this one is new and normal, it would be uh, wide open and that like your spinal canal. And I have a rubber band wrapped around here just to illustrate um, pinching off the spinal canal, making it more narrow. And that's what spinal stenosis is. And I'll come back to this um, in a minute. So what happens is when that spinal cord gets pinched a little bit, um, by either the ligament or the arthritis, then that's what gives you those symptoms in the back and legs. So on the most conservative end for treating this kind of thing, you can certainly use different anti-inflammatories or pain medications if needed. Um, but the key is not to just stay in bed all day. It's, you know, even if you're having pain, you don't want to rely on something like bed rest. Um, that's been found to just make a lot of things worse in the long run. So you got to stay active. And so figuring out what you can do, it can be a challenge in the beginning. So sometimes we'll send people to physical therapy. They can help with different um, manipulation of your soft tissues and just getting you moving, which really helps with just getting blood flow to the area, which is good for healing. Uh, just keeping all the soft tissues that surround your back as mobile and strong as possible because that mechanically offloads your spine, which is a good thing. Um, some of the specific activities that people with stenosis can tolerate a little better would be cycling or like riding a stationary bike. And that's because you're in a leaned forward position on the bike and that tends to be better with stenosis. And the reason why, just to illustrate, this is a spine and this is the back. The orange tube is your spinal cord that travels up and down the spine. So that's where uh, the pinching is occurring. So if this person from the side were to lean forward, let's just focus on this level right here. You can see that if I lean forward, I'm opening up the space and I'm exaggerating a little bit. But when you're standing upright, the tightness there is closed. And then as you lean forward, you can clearly see mechanically how it opens up the space where that orange tube is. And so that's why if you're leaning forward over a shopping cart or a walker, or if you're sitting on a bike, you're leaning forward, the stenosis is relieved a little bit just by that leaning forward. So doing uh, exercise on a bike can be help, a nice way to just stay active while you're getting treated. Another thing is uh, walking uphill. When you walk uphill, you tend to lean forward a little bit just to, because you're walking uphill. And that that is for the same reason would you might be able to tolerate walking a little further. Now, obviously if you're outside, if you, if you walk uphill, you're going to have to walk downhill at some point, which is probably going to make it worse. So this would be ideal if you had a treadmill or access to a gym with a treadmill where you can just set the incline up a few degrees and then try some walking at an incline. Um, and that, if that gets you just lean forward a little bit, that could help. Again, the goal here is just to like stay active. Um, so 
Beyond the physical therapy, um, some of these exercises, uh, one trick a lot of people tell me that uh, they have trouble when they're standing, like let's say at the sink doing dishes or at the, the stove cooking, standing in that one place for a while. So if you just get like a step stool and just kind of put one foot up on the step stool, um, just that motion of lifting the uh, your leg up will introduce a little bit of rounding in the back, which can open up that canal a little bit. So for some people, it might just be that little adjustment that will allow you to stand longer or, you know, just tolerate it a little better. So that's just another little trick you can try if you're having symptoms like this. Um, if you have any like flare ups of pain, people always ask about ice or heat. Uh, for some of the pain flare-ups we get, ice can be a good thing uh, to try in that acute period. I say heat is tends to be a little better to kind of warm up the muscles. Let's say you want to try some exercise or try some activity, some stretches or go out for a walk. Applying heat before that can be helpful just to warm things up. Um, but again, ice and heat can kind of be used interchangeably. You can try them both and, and see which works for you. Um, so those are kind of all the conservative things. And if those all don't work, then you end up with someone like me and, you know, we might get some imaging. We might, uh, you know, we're going to ask you about your history of your pain and poke around a little bit and move you around and try and figure out if we do think it's stenosis. There's obviously other things it could be. If in fact we do think it's stenosis that's causing your pain, we'll usually start with an epidural steroid injection. It's done under x-ray. You lay on your stomach. It's a very simple procedure. It takes five minutes. Um, and we essentially guide a needle under x-ray right into the middle. And we put some anti-inflammatory into the spinal canal where the stenosis is. So this can work good for some people, but really we're not mechanically changing anything. We're not fixing the stenosis. We're just trying to get rid of inflammation. And that does work great for some people. But if an, if an injection doesn't help, what you really need is for that stenosis to get relieved. You need a mechanical fix to open up that canal. Traditionally in the past, you would have had to go to a surgeon and they would do a big surgery where they would, you know, make an incision and they would take out bone. And it's, you know, there was a big recovery afterwards. It's a much bigger, much bigger commitment to try and decide if you want to do that. So there's now something in between that really is not much more invasive than an epidural injection. And in the studies, it's actually just as safe. And it's called the mild procedure. It stands for minimally invasive lumbar decompression. And what we're doing is we're starting out like an epidural with a needle type device that we can then insert a tool in to try and clip a, chip away at that either bony overgrowth and or the ligament that has thickened. And so we're actually mechanically changing the structure in the spinal canal. So back to my example of the toilet paper roll here, which is now getting pinched because of this rubber band, which is in, uh, representing the ligament. So the mild procedure, we go in with our tool and we basically just chip away at the ligament. And what that does is it relieves some of the pressure in your spinal canal so that you can, you know, basically try and open up that space again more. We're not going to make your spine 20, like a 20 year old, but a lot of times all it needs is just that little bit of opening and that relieves the symptoms greatly. And because it's a very safe procedure, it's a, uh, it's a nice option for people that especially don't want surgery. So we do this in a surgery center, uh, but it's an outpatient procedure. You, there's no restrictions afterwards. Uh, within 24 hours, people are typically back to doing um, any activity they want, essentially. I'm just going to flip something over here. Bear with me one second. All right. So essentially with the mild procedure, they did a study that lasted over five years, just looking at patients who had it done. 88% of them were able to avoid surgery. So that's, that's almost nine out of 10 patients were able to avoid surgery, that's, which is awesome. There's no implants with the mild procedure. So you, there's no hardware that's getting put in you. There's nothing that's getting left in you. Um, it's all done with these instruments. Uh, and, and the fact that there's nothing put in you is, is a nice plus to it. So it doesn't actually change the integrity of your spinal canal at all. We're not taking bone out um, like a surgeon would do. We're just kind of chipping away at some of these things, which doesn't change the integrity of it. Um, the biggest functional improvements they saw after the mild procedure were an increase in standing time and an increase in walking distance. And they were dramatic increases. And function is really what I like to look at the best because um, I like people to stay active. And so my goal is always to keep people as active as possible doing what they want to do.
and it's safe. So that on the flip side of things, you want to make sure any procedure you undergo is a safe procedure. So over that five year of study, it was shown to be just as safe as an epidural injection. So that's pretty convincing. Um, again, you have no restrictions. You can essentially resume normal activity by the next day, which is amazing. Um, and it's just a single tiny incision. There's no stitches. Um, so that is I'm trying to think. That's pretty much it. Um, if you think you might be a candidate uh, or have think you might have spinal stenosis, you know, we can certainly see you and evaluate you. Um, but it's, it's just great to have uh, tools available that we can help patients without doing these big surgeries and getting them back to doing the things they love. So if you have any like any specific questions, um, feel free to comment in the in the chat. Um, or, you know, if this is posted later and you're watching this later, um, you know, you can always give us a call and just come in to see us. So is there any questions that you see? Well, one question we had over the weekend um, from a patient was, if someone has spinal stenosis and scoliosis, are they eligible for the mild procedure? Okay, should I reread that or do you think they heard it? So the question was, if you have both spinal stenosis and scoliosis, are you eligible for the mild procedure? Um, and the answer is yes. Certainly, there's different degrees of scoliosis. Most people that have scoliosis, it's, it's certainly not bad enough that it would affect our ability to do the mild procedure at all. Um, you know, if it's a more severe scoliosis, it's something we might have to evaluate like on a case-by-case -case basis, take a look at your imaging and things like that. But for the most part, that shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. Um, and then another question we had before was typically how long do patients get relief? From the mild procedure. So the question is, how long do you get relief from the mild procedure? You know, everybody, whenever we do any injections or anything, people always say, how long is this going to last? And it's, you know, it, it is very difficult to predict because there's such a wide variance in people and what their back looks like. And, um, you know, the difference between a 50 year old with just mild stenosis versus an 80 year old with severe stenosis, you know, so it's tough to generalize these things. Most people that get the mild procedure, if we, once that canal is opened up, they should be good for a long time, potentially more than a year. It's, it's just a matter of stenosis is a progressive disorder. So it certainly could progress and come back at a later date. You also can have stenosis at other levels. So let's say we fix one level, you may become symptomatic down the road from another level, in which case we can just go back and do the mild procedure at another level. Um, so it, it is very hard to predict, but you know, it can be anywhere from six months to a year or even multiple years. Um, are there any other treatments in addition to mild that would be used for spinal stenosis and can you get multiple? So are there any other treatments for spinal stenosis? Um, and can you get multiple, I assume levels you mean? Um, so yes, you can get multiple levels. So if when we're seeing you for the first time, uh, we know that you have two levels of significant stenosis, then the mild procedure can be done on both levels at the same time. So we just knock it out all at once. Um, there are other procedures out there. Uh, obviously surgery is one that I kind of briefly talked about. There's another procedure called the Vertiflex procedure, which is very nice for select patients. The main difference with that one is that it, there's hardware that's impl uh, implanted. So it's a little device um, it's essentially inserted in between two of your spinous processes, these bones here, and it just mechanically opens up, puts, puts that little bend in your spine to open up the canal. Um, but then you have that piece of hardware in there that, that's left in there that's surgically put in. So um, it's slightly more invasive, I would say, just because of that, but it, but it is another good option for the right patient. Um, and how big is the incision? So in terms of surgery for the mild. How big is the incision for the mild? So it's maybe like a quarter of an inch. Um, it's, it's literally just a little poke with a scalpel to just make a, that tiny incision, and that's it. Um, it's not even big enough to require any stitches, which is nice. I mean, there's, you get a Band-Aid at the end, so it's, it's, it's very small. No more questions? Okay. All right, so um, again, if you do have any other questions, if you're watching this later, give our office a call. Um, any of our doctors uh, know very well about this procedure. We'd be happy to see you, answer any questions, to determine if this might be right for you. Um, otherwise, thanks for tuning in and watching. All right, bye.